us there. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? So um, I'm going to talk about um, early stage mycosis fungoides, focusing on things that are either applied to the skin or done externally, not systemic medications. Uh, Stefan is going to cover the uh, systemic uh, treatments. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Foundation for having me. Um, this is a truly wonderful organization. It's, it's unique uh, in its, it's a real community of learners. Uh, at, at every uh, level. Uh, my story is a little different um, in that I was a practicing dermatologist for about 25 years, and then I went back and did a fellowship at age 58. And my wife has since called me the world's oldest fellow, <laughs> even though I'm not a fellow anymore. So um, anyway, and um, I'm gonna um, talk not only about um, topical treatments for the skin, but I'd like to at least cover um, some ways of learning about um, cutaneous lymphoma. The um, website, have you all been on this website? It's, it's gotta be one of the greatest uh, teaching websites out there. And I was amazed that when you, Susan was saying how small the staff is, uh, you can, any physician can learn a lot from that site. Have you been on this site, the nccn.org, anybody? So I'm going to cover a little bit on that. Um, it's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and this is a group of experts in the U.S. who uh, put their heads together to come up with uh, recommendations. And then um, clinicaltrials.gov is another excellent uh, website, although I have to say the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation website covers a lot on clinical trials also. And um, they must acknowledge Marianne Pawa, my hero, um, from Boston, who, uh, aside from uh, helping me along the way, uh, has allowed me to use some of her slides. Um, as we've covered, there's a big umbrella under the heading of cutaneous lymphoma. These are T and B cell lymphomas. Um, these are the T cell lymphomas, which Carrie just beautifully covered. And um, if we focus just on this group, um, we'll cover a lot of. Um, of the bulk of uh, cutaneous T cell lymphomas, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, one of the ways that I found it very helpful to learn about lymphoma was to go back and study the history of uh, cutaneous lymphoma. And if anyone has a few hours, uh, I'd recommend it. And if if you really want to go a little crazy, if you um, look at a timeline of immunology compared to cutaneous lymphoma, you can see how Technical breakthroughs were, uh, in, in general, uh, biology had a lot to do with breakthroughs in cutaneous lymphoma. Um, in, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so in 1806, uh, Dr. Alibert, a French dermatologist, described mushroom-like lesions on the skin of a patient, and he used the term mycosis fungoides to describe this condition, which loosely meant mushroom-like fungal disease and it's not a fungal disease at all. And many years later, his student uh, kind of went backward and identified patients that went from patch to plaque to nodular uh, tumors um, in mycosis fungoides. And here's one of the uh, historical perspectives from 2001, and there was a recent one in 2017, if anyone's interested. I just kind of summarized uh, this history. So uh, mycosis, uh, this is uh, Lucas, the index patient. Um, uh, so uh, Albert described mycosis fungoides 26 years before Hodgkin's disease uh, was described. It arguably was the first lymphoma uh, described, although they weren't calling it lymphoma at that time. And then in uh, 1902, um, Brock described something called parasoriasis, uh, which uh, was the bane of my life uh, as a fellow because I couldn't make out what it meant. It's, it's basically sort of like pre-mycosis fungoides, and, and experts don't always agree about what this means, even today. Uh, Cesare syndrome was described in 1949. It wasn't until 1974 that the immunologic features of uh, 
uh, lymphoma were described. The term CTCL was introduced in 1975. And what this did was it took lymphomas from the blood system to organ specific uh, lymphoma. So these are lymphomas specific to the skin. So that was a good thing. It has, I think, made things more confusing because people tend to lump CTCL as one disease and it makes it a little confusing. And that's why I'm, I'm focusing on mycosis fungoides. And over the last 25 years, there have been several attempts to um, classify the disease so that people in Europe and the United States and around the world are all talking about the same thing so the treatment can be personalized um, for each person. Um, Kerry went over the difference between patch, plaque, being slightly elevated, tumors, and I won't repeat the staging. But it is mostly you would think about um, using skin directed therapy in early stage mycosis fungoides, although uh, not uncommonly um, it can be combined with systemic uh, therapy for more advanced cases. This looks at the risk of progression uh, based on the stage. And 75% of people who are stage 1A at diagnosis will stay that way. But there are small numbers who will uh, advance, and the risk seems to go up based on the stage at diagnosis. And the real challenge in the next uh, breakthrough will be trying to stratify uh, what it is, either molecularly in DNA, RNA, protein, that uh, makes that small subset of people uh, progress. And here you can see, this is looking at overall survival. People who um, are diagnosed with stage 1A uh, mycosis fungoides basically have a normal uh, or almost normal uh, lifespan, but um, moving further down, uh, the overall survival is less. And there seems to be something about age in the people who are diagnosed uh, at the time of diagnosis at below the age of 50 and have a better um, disease-free, this is disease-free survival rather than survival. And uh, I'd like to just introduce this NCCN guidelines and what they say about um, uh, diagnosis and treatment of uh, cutaneous lymphomas. They talk about essential uh, lab work, pretty much exactly what Carrie uh, talked about uh, doing, including the clonality testing. Um, but keeping in mind that there is no one uh, blood test or lab test for uh, mycosis fungoides or T-cell lymphoma, it's sort of a clinical and pathological diagnosis. Um, and here is their algorithm for early stage, less than 10% uh, body surface area. And unless there's blood involvement, they recommend skin-directed therapies. CR stands for complete response, PR, partial response. And if um, the initial skin-directed therapies fail, uh, but they still have T1 disease, you can go back and try something else among the uh, menu of options uh, of skin-directed therapies. Uh, similarly for stage 1B, um, primarily uh, with lower disease burden, particularly more, here they're making a distinction between patch stage and plaque stage MF. Um, even though um, the staging lumps patch and plaque together, here they're, they're making the observation that the people with patch stage uh, MF tend to do better and can be treated less aggressively with skin-directed therapies. If there's a complete or partial response with low skin burden, again, go back and try something uh, else within that category. If the burden of disease increases, then you uh, move on to the systemic treatment that Stefan will talk about. Here with the higher stage uh, or higher burden of plaques, um, you can use skin-directed therapies or systemic therapies or a combination of the two. And this looks at the tumor stage. Um, for limited tumor stage uh, disease, the one skin-directed therapy that might quite often be uh, considered is uh, 
local radiation. Otherwise, it tends to be moving on to systemic treatment. So what do we mean by um, skin-directed therapy? The most common skin-directed therapy is topical corticosteroids. That B is just a footnote that it can cause skin thinning if used excessively, although honestly, I don't think most of us worry too much about that. Um, another uh, good uh, skin-directed therapy is uh, topical nitrogen mustard. Uh, local radiation um, has come back. It's uh, Dermatologists used to have little x-ray machines in their offices and would treat everything from acne to eczema with radiation. And they got in trouble um, with their machines, not realizing some of the long-term effects. But now using much lower doses and much more targeted treatment, um, radiation has definitely made a strong comeback. Uh, topical retinoids. Uh, retinoids are vitamin A derivatives that affect uh, cell proliferation and cell death and uh, cell proliferation. Um, these can be given orally also. In uh, my own personal experience, it's more with using these orally. Phototherapy uh, is ultraviolet light treatment. This is often done in a dermatologist's office and there are different bulbs in the booth. It's somewhat like a vertical tanning booth some of the bulbs have a broad spectrum of ultraviolet B, some a narrow band, with just uh, nanometers of 311. And then there's something called PUVA, where um, a drug called sorolin is combined with long wavelength ultraviolet A. Topical imiquimod is a um, immune augmenting uh, product. It's mainly used uh, to treat uh, warts and, and superficial skin cancers. It has a role in uh, mycosis fungoides. One problem is that uh, imiquimod comes in tiny little packets and to use it on a wide area is um, cost prohibitive for a lot of people if, depending on how extensive disease is. And then in generalized, and this is again from NCCN, in generalized mycosis fungoides, there's a role for all of these also to be used in combination. So the goals of skin-directed therapy are one, to help control the disease. But one thing that's gotten a lot of attention that Dr. Wood uh, highlighted is quality of life. And uh, perhaps itching is uh, a major uh, consideration and one of the things that we try for hard now is not only to clear the skin, but to, to make life as pleasant and comfortable as we can. And uh, skin-directed therapies have a lot to do with that. Uh, we aim for remission, but um, I'd say many people think that the only real cure for MF is with a stem cell transplant. Uh, and so we are trying to balance the uh, treatment with um, the aggressiveness of the disease and we want something that's effective and manageable. Um, here's the NCCN guidelines on pruritus and um, I, I won't spend too much time on this but um, if, if this is a problem that you're having I be reassured that there's a lot of interest in this area starting with avoiding skin dryness, um, using the right topical steroids, the right antihistamines, there are drugs uh, that are used for neuropathy that can help. Uh, and there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing also for itching. Uh, so we'll just talk a little bit about some of these in more detail. Topical steroids are often a first line treatment for patch stage mycosis fungoides. Um, these, uh, have, these turn down the immune system and they reduce inflammation. So they can be very helpful for itch. And uh, they do tend to um, tend to um, cause uh, at least temporary regression of patches of MF and sometimes plaques of MF. Um, with prolonged use, you have to worry about um, skin thinning and if used over wide areas of the body, some may be absorbed. There's a ranking system of how potent these are. So frequently we'll alternate high potency with lower potency drugs to minimize side effects. Uh, nitrogen mustard has a rich history. 
Uh, this was used in chemical warfare uh, and I think it was in World War I and two noted um, pharmacologists discovered the effectiveness in treating lymphoma in mice, uh, but they didn't uh, publish their results until 1946. And nitrogen mustard was the first drug approved for systemic uh, control, systemic treatment of lymphoma. And uh, there is a product, we used to have to compound nitrogen mustard to use topically, but there's a product uh, that's available now, Valtlor. And uh, one thing to know about nitrogen mustard is the, it takes a while for it to work. And so um, you have to be patient with nitrogen mustard. And uh, there's several side effects, mostly irritation and uh, eczematous type reactions. But um, we can um, use topical steroids uh, with nitrogen mustard to mitigate some of those side effects. Um, uh, it's bitter it carcinogen, uh, so you have to be careful in your house. Wide areas can rarely affect, uh, suppress your bone marrow. Um, so I'll move on to the retinoids, which I talked about before. Um, again, I personally have more used the oral retinoids, um, these vitamin A derivatives. The uh, topical come in gel forms, and um, these, there are pregnancy warnings uh, that uh, these drugs can be harmful to the fetus uh, in a pregnant female. Um, gels have a lot of alcohol in them. They can cause redness, itching, and burning. We start gradually. Um, I'll move on to ultraviolet light, which we talked about. Um, it's one of the most widely used skin-directed uh, treatment for early stage uh, mycosis fungoides. Um, it was known that people often did better in the summer with natural sunlight, and that kind of led to uh, trying to create artificial sunlight with ultra artificial sunlight includes both ultraviolet B and ultraviolet A, um, and um, they all have their. I'd say we tend to use more of the ultraviolet narrow band uh, because. This isn't associated with uh, increased risk of skin cancer. PUVA, the Sorlin plus ultraviolet A, are longer wavelengths of UVA. They penetrate more deeply in the skin, which has some value. The PUVA definitely has been associated with causing uh, uh, squamous cell skin cancers. This just looks at the, again, the UV range. Ultraviolet C is 200 to 290, ultraviolet B, 290 to 320, ultraviolet A, 320 to 400. Um, the mechanism of action of ultraviolet light, um, it has a lot of effects, um, both on the surface and in inducing cell death. It, it penetrates well into the uh, surface layer of the skin and the uh, cells that present of proteins to, to the immune system. And so here's a good candidate for this widespread disease. You may not want to um, treat their whole body with topical creams and stuff. Um, and so this would be a good candidate possibly for ultraviolet light. Um, ultraviolet light treatments tend to be done in dermatologist offices, although it is possible to get a home unit um, we do not encourage tanning booth use at all. We typically use two or three times per week until we see a remission, and then we gradually uh, taper to once a week, every other week, and then, um, and then by taking them off slowly. Um, depending on where a person lives, uh, ultraviolet light therapy may not be practical for their lifestyle, but it is an excellent treatment. And here's an article that was just published uh, this year, Potential Narrowband Ultraviolet B to Induce Sustained Durable Complete Remission Off Therapy in Stage 1 Mycosis Fungoides. And they looked at a group of patients and uh, did a single course of narrowband ultraviolet B. I think it was like 40 or 50 treatments. And um, more than half uh, went into what seems like a permanent remission. And they're saying that perhaps this could be considered a disease-modifying therapy. Of the 100 
17 patients who started narrow band, and you'd be 93 or 80% had complete remissions and 56 or 60% were disease free as of March of 2017. And in their statistical analysis, disease-free survival was affected independently by age and disease stage only. Uh, disease-free survival was longer for younger patients uh, than those greater than 50 years of age, and longer for stage 1A patients than stage 1B patients. And that's their summary, um, which we just basically covered. Um, radiation therapy can be given locally to individual tumors or it can be given over all of the skin. Um, uh, this is a picture of um, what would be electron therapy. Uh, electrons are charged particles and um, uh, total skin electron beam therapy delivers treatment to a wide field. You can uh, treat all of the skin. It's technically challenging. You need a linear accelerator to do this. Um, it's only done in specialized centers. Um, there's a limit to how much radiation you can give cumulatively to people. Um, side effects include redness, uh, dryness, hair and nail loss, problems with sweating, eye irritation. Um, but for some people, it can make a big positive effect. Then there's um, another uh, type of radiation using what are called photons. And this is particularly helpful for uh, complex surfaces. Um, the, the electron therapy doesn't work around curved surface areas or areas um, where it's just not even or flat. And here, um, little tiny tubes uh, containing radioactive material are placed and uh, using uh, uh, computer and x-ray imaging you can, uh, what Dr. Devlin used to say, paint the tumors. Uh, this is a person uh, that Carrie probably remembers uh, who was so miserable uh, with his feet that was, was it true that they were considering amputation or something to that effect? Yeah. So, um, and uh, with uh, brachytherapy um, effectively caused a durable remission. Um, this is the so-called isodosing using the imaging with the controlled uh, dosing of uh, radioactive, very low doses of radiation. This is another study from 2019, February, um, where using a complex formula, uh, they tried to look at treatment of uh, mycosis fungoides from a cost uh, and treatment perspective. And the combination of local radiation and phototherapy were judged to be the most uh, cost-effective treatments for stage 1A. Uh, and they said local radiation is the most cost-effective treatment for limited local disease, whereas uh, narrowband or PUVA is cost-effective for generalized disease. But there are a lot of assumptions made, and I, I don't think this is gospel yet. Um, this was their analysis of the cost differences of the different treatment options of a three-month treatment cycle. And um, this um, I put in, um, this was a recent uh, letter to the editor. Um, um, saying that stage 1A my mycosis fungoides should be treated until proven otherwise. Um, in Europe, uh, in their treatment algorithms, they leave open the option of simple observation for stage 1A disease. And one of the problems is that there's not been a study and will never be a study where you take one group of stage 1A patients and treat them and another group where you don't treat them and follow and see who does better. Um, but it is uh, still a matter of some debate. So I'm going to wrap up here and summarize that the total overall prognosis for early stage mycosis fungoides is excellent. There are several options for skin-directed treatment that may be used singly or in combination. Treatment choices should and will be individualized based on your own preferences. And be sure to let your doctors uh, and providers know of any quality of life issues that you're experiencing. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.